Well, like I said, we are going to be in John chapter 12 this morning. If you guys want to read along with me, I'm going to break the passage up into a couple different chunks. We're going to start in verse 1 of John 12. John writes, Six days before the Passover, Jesus therefore came to Bethany, where Lazarus was, whom Jesus had raised from the dead. So they gave a dinner for him there. Martha served, and Lazarus was one of those reclining at the table with him. Mary therefore took a pound of expensive ointment made from pure nard and anointed the feet of Jesus and wiped his feet with her hair. The house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. Now we see as John writes this, this is six days before the Passover. There is a little bit of disagreement and debate amongst biblical scholars on what exactly the timeline of what we know now as Holy Week is, the week leading up to Easter, the death and the resurrection of Jesus. But John right here gives us this very hard date, six days before the Passover. Now in a time uh, like the one that Jesus lived in, we didn't have cars, they didn't have Teslas zipping around Jerusalem and everything like that. Um, and Jesus and his disciples, they walked everywhere. They had been in Jerusalem and Bethany recently. That's when Lazarus was raised from the dead. And then we saw at the end of John 11, it says that Caiaphas prophesied that Jesus would die to save Israel. And it says that Jesus no longer walked openly amongst the Jews, but instead he went into the wilderness and he kind of hid himself um, because it was not yet time for him to die. But here we see Jesus returning back to Jerusalem, but he's not quite there yet. He is on his way there, um, and he stops in a little town called Bethany. Now, Bethany is really kind of like a suburb of Jerusalem. It's about two miles out from the city center. So if you are from the Portland area, like Beaverton or Tigard, any of those cities, if you're from Eugene, Coburg. Now, I've only lived in Eugene for about six years, and when I moved here, Somebody said, oh, that's way out in Coburg. I said, how far is that? And they're like, 10 minutes. <laughs> oh, that's forever. Like, and I was like, way out in Coburg. Now, I think it's because at one point, Eugene was pretty much just south of the river, downtown where the university is. And then as it began expanding, now like you can leave our Ecclesia office and you can be in Coburg in like five minutes. So far out. In reality, though, Jesus was walking, and as he was making his way to Jerusalem, as he was making his way to the holy city for the Passover celebration, he chooses to go through the town of Bethany. This is where his friends Mary, Martha, and Lazarus lived, as well as a guy that sometimes scripture refers to as Simon the leper. This was a man that Jesus had done a miracle in his life. He was now a Jesus follower, and they end up at Simon's house for this dinner. Now, we re can read a parallel account of this in Matthew chapter 26, and it's important to remember that each one of the gospel accounts, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, there are some times where it's talking about the same event, and there are some times where it's just similar events. Remember, Jesus was in ministry for about three years. Here, we can read a parallel of this account where Matthew chooses to remind us that they're in the home of Simon the leper, though John leaves that out. Each one of these gospel accounts is written with an intended audience and an intended purpose, as Matthew walked with Jesus, John also walked with Jesus. But Matthew saw Jesus a little bit differently than John does. John is one of the closest disciples, and he gives us this account of Jesus with Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. Now, um, whenever my wife and I, we go and we visit Portland, we've got some friends in Portland that we always reach out to. It's been a while since we've really spent time in Portland because of the whole, you know, like the world shut down kind of thing. Um, but when we do go, we always call up friends and we're like, hey, we're going to be in town these days. You guys want to grab lunch? You want to grab coffee? And I've got some friends who live in Portland, one of whom I grew up with in Louisiana. We both ended up 3,000 miles across the country to end up in Oregon. And they are some of the most hospitable people ever. They've got a finished basement. And if I'm like, hey, man, we're going to be in Portland. He's like, oh, you guys should stay in my basement, which is a lot cheaper than a hotel. So we always take them up on that offer. Um, but they're the kind of friends that you want to spend time with. Right? We've got history, we've got relationship. When we get together, we always talk about old times, the things we've experienced together, and we want to spend time with those people. You can almost think of Mary, Martha, and Lazarus as these people that Jesus, Jesus enjoys spending time with. 
Sometimes we can just get this really stuffy, stoic picture of Jesus where he's just like kind of grumpy and angry and he's always got a scowl on his face. But Jesus was, was fully God, but he was fully man. He's got friends. He cares about his mom and the relationships with the people that he's got around them. He stops in Bethany to visit his friends. The only difference is when I call up my friend Winston, who lives in Portland, I didn't raise him from the dead. We were in a band together. We hung out. We liked some of the same food. We really like coffee. We've got things we bond over, but it's not like I performed a miracle in his life. When Jesus calls on Lazarus, Lazarus is ready to be there. Yes, Jesus, you're going to be in town. Let's spend time together. He is eager to sit at the feet of God because he recognizes exactly who Jesus really is. We see in Luke chapter 10, verse 38, this previous account of Jesus spending time in the home of Martha and Mary. And at this point, Jesus says that he and his disciples were on his way and he came to a village where a woman named Martha opened her home to him. She had a sister called Mary who sat at the Lord's feet listening to what he said. But Martha was distracted by all the preparations that had to be made. She came to him and asked, Lord, don't you care that my sister has left me to do the work by myself? Tell her to help me. Here's what I want us to see from this previous interaction Martha has with Jesus. She had recognized that Jesus was not just anyone. She had heard about Jesus. He arrives in her town and she welcomes him into her home. Now, biblically, in the Old Testament, we see calls for God's people to welcome the stranger, to welcome the sojourner, to take care of those who are traveling through. But we also see in the Old Testament that God's people wandered pretty hard away from his word, away from his truth. For Martha to ask, ask and welcome Jesus into her home, this was a big deal, and it's because he wasn't just somebody. She realized that Jesus was different. In fact, if you read in verse 40, Martha said that Jesus was Lord. She says, Lord, don't you care that my sister has left me to do the work? She recognizes Jesus's divinity. He is not just someone who is important. She is, he is, not she, he is God in the flesh. And we see that she's complaining, Jesus, don't, won't, don't you want her to help me? I'm doing all of this work for you. I'm, I'm trying to make the house nice for you. I'm preparing dinner for you. Tell her to help me. But Mary instead sits at the feet of Jesus. And I can only imagine what that was like to sit in the presence of Jesus. And there's all this hustle and bustle, all these things going around in the background. But you've almost got tunnel vision. You see Jesus as the living God. Mary cannot wait to soak up whatever Jesus has to say. When we look at this account, though, it's just a little bit different. We see, however, unlike the first time that Jesus has dinner with Mary, Martha, and Lazarus, this time there isn't a complaint in the room. We see Martha again serving dinner and preparing the meal for Jesus, but this time she's not like, why isn't Mary helping me? No, this time she is exercising her gifts and her passions. In fact, this is an opportunity for him or for her to serve the God that she loves. She's naturally a server. She's wired that way. And serving is, in fact, a huge part of the Christian walk. There are people in this room who come and they help set up the stage and the truss and the lights and the screen and all this stuff every week. We've got people who serve on our hospitality team, and we need more people to serve on our hospitality team. We've got people who serve in our kids with the youngest disciples, who serve with me on youth on Wednesdays, who lead community groups, who, who love our community and serve our church. That is an act of worship. She sees this as an act of worship, Martha does, and God sees it as worship as well. There's not just this static faith, oh, I'm just not going to do anything and let Jesus kind of do his thing. There's an opportunity to serve the Lord. That's really what we're called to do as Jesus followers. My parents visited from uh, Louisiana just a couple weeks ago, and before they arrived, I told my wife, I said, hey, we need to start cleaning the house. We need to get it clean. We've got family coming to visit. We need to get it clean. And not just because like you want your house clean when someone visits, but like my parents, they, they expect it to be clean. 
So we tried to get our house clean and not just like clean, like, like your in-laws are coming over clean. Like you're expecting them to take a white glove and like rub it on the inside of the cabinets and be like, mm, mm-hmm. Like, so we try getting things spotless. One, out of respect. Two, because we want to enjoy the time together. We want to be able to focus on the task at hand. Now, my parents showed up and they opened a suitcase and pulled out gifts and immediately our living room was a wreck again. But we spent time trying to prepare our home for our guests as they arrived. My parents are in no way God, but I love my mom and dad. Mary and Martha and Lazarus have this opportunity to serve Jesus, to serve dinner, to, to, to create a space where they are in tune with who he is. You know, serving is such a big part of the church and such, such a call to action that we actually see in Matthew chapter 25, Jesus is sharing this parable where he talks about a king and the king says that when he was hungry, he was fed and, and he was clothed and he was sheltered. And when he was sick, they met with him. And when he was thirsty, they gave him drink. And he said, you have done this for me. And the king's subjects say, Lord, when have we done any of those things for you? And Jesus responds in Matthew 25, verse 40, and the king will answer them. Truly, I say to you, as you did it to one of the least of these of my brothers, you did it to me. James, the brother of Jesus, actually says in James chapter 1, verse 27, religion that is pure and undefiled before God the Father is this, to visit widows and orphans in their affliction and to keep oneself unstained from the world. Guys, serving not just in the church, but outside the walls of of the church, for the people that are hard to love, for the people who might go by unseen, but we know that they are there. We are called to love the people that God has created, whether they look like us or they act like us or their financial situation is the same as us or not. And loving them and serving them is in fact an act of worship. Martha saw Jesus as Lord and that moved her to worship. And the church needs those people who worship God through serving. I'm going to tell you guys what, at 530, when we open this room, we've got a team of people and they come in and nobody is like, Ugh, it's 530. I don't know how many of them have two or three or four cups of coffee before they get here, but they are excited to serve the Lord. They're excited to do that. And Martha here is passionate about this. Her brother Lazarus, it says, reclines at the table with Jesus. Now, in Jesus's day, there would have been a low table and they would be sitting on the ground or on pads with their feet kind of away from the table, leaning towards the table and eating off of it. And Lazarus takes this moment to sit at the feet of Jesus. He's dining at the table with Jesus, waiting for every word that comes from his mouth. Now, as I started reading this, I started thinking about kind of like that fabled, like if Jesus was your dinner guest, how would you act or what would you serve or that sort of thing? A question we've all probably been asked in some way, shape or form. And that kind of made me think about, again, that real Jesus. Do you guys think Jesus made small talk? Do you guys think Jesus was like, yeah, man, interest rates are great right now. Can't wait to buy a house or, you know, oh man, that heat wave a couple weeks ago. Oof, like, I think there was probably a point in Jesus's life where small talk may, may have occurred because he's, he's human just like us. He's got friends like us. He would see people in the marketplace. He would say, hey, he had a job. Like he, he was real. This is not just a mythological creature, but he's also fully God. And then once Jesus begins his ministry, and remember, this is six days before the Passover. Jesus's death is very, very soon. At this point, I don't think Jesus is making small talk. And I don't think so because there is an urgency. Jesus has days left on earth before his crucifixion. His message to repent, turn from your sin, and turn to the Lord is necessary. And Steve taught just a couple weeks ago about the urgency that we should have with the gospel. We cannot just sit and wait for someone else to go and bring the message of Jesus Christ to the city that we live in. That's just not how it works, guys. We should be on mission in our daily lives. 
And a lot of that begins with sitting under the teaching of Jesus, praying, Jesus, speak to me. Not in a, I need to hear an audible voice to believe kind of way, but speak to me in a way that you've revealed your truth to me, that I would be passionate and motivated to go and love your people, to go in love and share the gospel. Lazarus is sitting, listening to every word Jesus has to say. Guys, when it comes to sharing the gospel, Jesus does not rely on your eloquence or your charisma. Instead, Jesus trusts in the Holy Spirit living inside of you to do what only God can do. The Holy Spirit has begun a good work in you. He is bringing you constantly closer to the Father, and instead, your obedience is the key here. Lazarus had the obedience to see Jesus for who he was, to sit at his table, and to enjoy the conversation, soaking in every single moment. Instead, I feel like sometimes we get distracted. And I'm a great example of this. We get distracted from the truth of God. And instead of looking for Jesus in every waking moment, sometimes there's weeks without going to church, weeks without reading our Bible, days or weeks even without prayer. And not that those things make you a Jesus follower, but those things are things that, that Christ followers do. Think about it this way. Lazarus had to wait for Jesus to return to Bethany to spend time with him. And as soon as Jesus shows up, he is eager to meet with Jesus. You and I, on the other hand, we've got unlimited access to the Lord. And I think sometimes that brings us to a point of complacency. Hopefully we eagerly await the return of Jesus, but our access begins now. Through the power of the Holy Spirit, we can bring our prayers to the Lord. He hears every word. He knows us intimately inside and out. Church, let's take the example of Lazarus and dine at the table with the Lord, soaking up everything he's got for us. And then that brings us to Mary. Now, if you recall in the encounter in Luke 10, Mary sat at Jesus' feet, just as Lazarus does now, waiting to take in anything he's got. But in this interaction, we see things a little bit differently. Verse three, again, Mary therefore took a pound of expensive ointment made from pure nard and anointed the feet of Jesus and wiped his feet with her hair. The house was filled with the fragrance and perfume. What Mary really does here is she takes her thing of value a lot of value, almost a year's salary. And she presents it to Jesus as an act of worship and submission. This is a picture of generosity, of a giving heart. This is surrender. Do we take the things that we have and do we use them to worship the God that we love? And this is not just for like the super wealthy millionaires and billionaires as they're having a space race. My wife and I, um, we bought our first home in October. This is a bit of a fixer-upper. Um, we're blessed to be able to buy the house, but it was pretty gross inside. Every wall pretty much needed to be painted. Um, the kitchen cabinets were painted the most horrendous, like 1970s butter yellow, and they were all sticking to each other. I thought they were glued shut at one point. Um, it, it's pretty rough. We don't have any animals inside and we've lived there for almost a year and we still find pet hair in the house, even though we tried to get it like mother-in-law clean. You know, that like our backyard hasn't been tended to in probably over a decade. The house, it, it just needed some love. And we got it for what we could afford, but, but it was a house that needed some love. But as we decided to put in an offer on a home, we began to pray, God, use this house to do your work. We want people to come into our home. We want people to hear the gospel. We want people to be loved. And we want Jesus to be magnified. Every week we host a community group in our home for young married couples. Just like there's so many community groups around our, like, around our city of people who passionately meet together and enjoy Jesus together and really get into relationship. And this is not a look at me. I lead a community group and I bought a house for, for Jesus no, this is, this is for all of us to look at what do we have? What has God blessed us with? Because really, this is a question of stewardship. 
Sometimes we talk about, oh, you need to steward your money well. Well, do you steward your vehicle well? Do you steward your time well or your home well? Do you use the things that you have in worship for the God who has literally brought you out of death and into life, just as he did Lazarus? Mary comes to the feet of Jesus and she takes this jar worth about a year's salary. It says 300 denarii that they could have sold it for. And she breaks it open. It's made of pure nard. It had to be imported from India. And she breaks it over the feet of Jesus and she uses it to anoint his feet. And then she takes her hair and she begins to wash his feet with her hair. Now, if someone walked into your house started rubbing your feet with their hair, you would look at them like they were crazy and you would ask them very politely and sternly to leave and never come back. (laughs) But Jesus doesn't interact with Mary this way at all because this is not her being crazy. This is an act, again, of worship. She is sitting literally at the feet of Jesus. Now, a picture of what, what feet were like at that point, I mean, they still had five toes and everything, but they didn't have paved roads in the same way that we do now. They didn't have indoor plumbing. The, the roads were gross. People were walking around in sandals all year long. And feet were considered so unclean that even the servant or slave in your home did not have to wash your feet. Instead, it was customary that when you entered someone's home, especially for a dinner party or something like that, they would provide you with a basin of water so that you could clean your feet. Even when you sat at the table, you sat with your feet away from the table. Feet were not very clean. And here's Mary going to the feet of Jesus, washing them with ointment and then washing them with her hair. This is similar to the story in Luke 7, where it says a woman of the city washes Jesus's feet with ointment and her tears and her hair. And this was probably from a couple years earlier. But this is the definition of countercultural. Because church, we are not called to live and to look like the world. Culture does not dictate who Jesus is. Instead, dictate, Jesus dictates what our culture should be doing. We have an obligation and an opportunity to live with a posture of worship and submission to the living God. Guys, this world that we live in, this is not our home. We are family of the king of kings. And when we understand the relationship that God is literally reaching out to us, it doesn't seem so out there to love Jesus at all costs. We really get that Mary, Martha, and Lazarus are a picture of the church. Martha serves, Lazarus listens, and Mary gives. And this is where we see the complaining come in. Not from Martha this time about how Mary isn't doing anything, but instead from one of Jesus's own disciples. We're gonna pick up in John chapter 12, verse four. If you wanna read along with me, it says, but Judas Iscariot, one of his disciples, he who was about to betray him, said, why was this ointment not sold for 300 denarii and given to the poor? He said this not because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. And having charge of the money bag, he used to help himself to what was put into it. Jesus said, leave her alone so that she may keep it for the day of my burial. For the poor you always have with you, but you will not always have me. Now, when John was writing this, he had already seen Jesus crucified, resurrection, resurrected and ascended into glory. But he makes sure to make this point about Judas about to betray Jesus. Again, this is only about a week or so before Jesus's death. The question, why wasn't this thing of value sold and given to the poor along with the anecdote that he was helping himself to whatever was in the money bag? He was stealing from the money bag. You know what this reminds me of? Genesis 3, when the serpent talks to Eve and twists the words of God. Now, we're obviously to care for the poor. Deuteronomy 15, 11 
says, for there will never cease to be poor in the land. Therefore, I command you, you shall open wide your hand to your brother, to the needy and to the poor in your land. We are called to love those who are hard to love or who, love, who look different than us, or maybe who we don't know. We are called to love those people and to serve those people. But here, Judas's heart is not of someone caring for the poor, but someone serving himself. One commentator even put it, he was thinking with his pocketbook and not with his heart. Well, why is this so important? The disciples didn't find out until later that Judas would be the one who would betray Jesus. But Jesus is God. Jesus knew. Jesus called Judas into ministry with him. There was intent there. Just like we read last week that Caiaphas prophesied that Jesus would die to, to save the nation of Israel, he had no idea what he was really saying, right? Judas's sin was also used by the Lord to fulfill his plan, ultimately to bring himself glory. Now, the contrast of Judas to the other three people directly mentioned in this passage is pretty radical because Judas has uninterrupted access to Jesus and yet he still chooses to sin. He's, he sees Jesus all the time and he begins to take Jesus for granted. Mary, Martha, and Lazarus have much more limited access, but can't wait to get more of Jesus, cannot wait to spend time with him. And it leads me to the question, do we take Jesus for granted? And if so, how do we even measure that? You can measure it by church attendance or Bible studies or, or how you disciple your spouse and your kids, how many, how many groups you're a part of or how much scripture you have memorized. But all of these are inward focused. My question is, how often do you evangelize? How often do you get outside of your comfort zone and you talk to people who don't know Jesus about Jesus? Let's put it this way. Do the people in our cities who know you and know that you follow Jesus, do they see you as different than themselves? Have you talked to them about who Jesus is, what he's done in your own life? Guys, we all have had encounters with God. We're here this morning for some reason because God has spoke to us because he's led us here or because we've grown up in church and we've seen Jesus move time after time after time. Do you share those stories with the people around us? Now, that doesn't mean you're force feeding the Bible down someone's throat. You're not hitting them over the head with the Bible or you're not condemning them. John, in chapter 13, verse 35, we're going to read in just a few weeks. Jesus says, by this, all people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. Judas might be a great example of someone who followed Jesus but was distracted by the world. He had very, very little fruit to show for his ministry. Instead of giving to the Lord, he stole from the Lord. Instead of being quick to listen to the Lord, he, 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 he spoke up. He was quick to speak. Instead of serving, he was serving himself. And this is kind of where Jesus snaps back, that the ointment, the thing of value should be used for his burial. Again, alluding to the fact that he knows his death is coming sooner than probably anyone else in the room. Now, it was common practice to anoint the head of the dead with oil. And Jesus saying that the rest of this ointment should be saved for himself. This is a blessing to the dead. Though Jesus know he wouldn't be dead for very long. And then this brings us to John chapter 12, verses 9 through 11. It says, when the large crowd of the Jews learned that Jesus was there, they came not only on account of him, but also to see Lazarus, whom he had raised from the dead. So the chief priests made plans to put Lazarus to death as well, because on account of him, many of the Jews were going away and believing in Jesus. Now, this Jewish crowd, some believed and some didn't. Some saw Jesus as Lord and some saw him as a heretic, as we've read over the last few weeks. But wherever Jesus goes, a crowd likely follows. And this time, not only is there Jesus, not only is there the one claiming to be the Son of God, there's the evidence of him being the Son of God. 
They want to go see Lazarus. They want, they want to touch Lazarus' hand. They want to hear his words. They want to see with their own eyes if Jesus really rose this guy from the dead. Think about it this way. We read just a few weeks ago when Jesus was told that Lazarus was sick, he didn't say, oh, well, I need to go heal him. It says he remained for two more days. By the time he finally showed up to Lazarus' tomb, he had been dead for four days. And he brings Lazarus back to life. Now, when I was a kid, I grew up kind of in church and I had heard about Jesus raising Lazarus from the dead um, and then raising himself from the dead. And then I heard about a bunch of rock stars from the 80s who were dead for a little while and were resuscitated. And I was like, wow, this is a total God thing. I don't think it's wrong. Literally, when somebody comes back from the dead, like God is moving. But for each and every single one of us, at one point in time, we were dead in our sin. And John 5, 24 says, we have crossed over from death into life. Jesus brings life wherever he goes. And Lazarus is, Lazarus? Lazarus is the evidence of that life. 2,000 years later, we're still talking about this story, this encounter with Jesus, where he shows people who he is. And as I look around this room, and I think about the people who are watching the live stream. That's God's church. That's the people that some have been wired and called and motivated to serve the kingdom. And some who have been called to just sit and soak up and listen to what the Lord has to say and then go and convey that message to share those encounters. And then those who, who, who are generous and giving with what they have. Think about those who participate in summer internships and school of Bible who want to grow. I think about God's church coming together. And really, we see with these three siblings, the church as a whole. As we read this story, I want us to think about our own stories, our own encounters with Jesus, Right? Let's not miss out on opportunity to share those encounters, to share the stories. Caiaphas' fear here was that people would hear the story of Lazarus and they would go and they would see that he was alive and they would turn and they would follow Jesus and he couldn't have that. But I think so often we take our own encounters with Jesus and we share them here with the people in this room where the people who will be so excited to hear, wow, that's incredible how God moved. And you should share those stories because God is doing something amazing. But what about the people who don't know who he is? What about the people who don't yet know Jesus, the people who are lost and they are wandering and they are looking for hope? What about them? Let's share those stories because we've got one. If you're here in this room, you've got a story, whether you felt like you needed to go to church this morning or God has healed one of your relatives from a disease, or he's healed you in some way, or you have just had an incredible experience. I know I've had one. We're pushing church camp right now, and church camp is just a couple weeks away. I want to say thank you to all of you guys who have helped um, give financially and help make that possible. But my first encounter with Jesus happened at a church camp when I was in high school. I was sitting in a room full of all these other high school and middle school kids, and I wasn't a Christian. I just came because there was a zip line. And somebody told me that, who wouldn't go to that, right? And I'm sitting in this room and the pastor goes, if you're here tonight and you don't think God's real, I want you to stand up. And I was like, there's no way I'm standing up. <laughs> and then he goes, if you're sitting there and you're saying, there's no way I'm standing up, I want you to stand up. And I was like, this is getting pretty weird. but I'm not standing up. And then he, then he, I promise, he goes, if you think this is getting really weird <laughs> and God might be trying to say something to you right now, I want you to stand up. So I stood up. And I looked across the room and my small group leaders looking across the room, we make eye contact and he takes me out of the back 
and he shares the gospel with me and I accept Jesus as my Lord and Savior for the first time. And in that moment, the trajectory of my life was changed. Every single one of my friends from middle school and high school has been to jail or prison. 100%. That's not an exaggeration. That's a factual number. That's the path that I was on. And God has me here instead preaching on a Sunday morning. I'm able to share the gospel truth with our kids and with our middle schoolers and our high schoolers and our college students every single week. God has changed my life and I've been able to have an impact on so many other people. And again, this is not about me. This is about what God does to broken and hurting people. He gives us these stories, these encounters, and you get to share that. Because when you go and you talk to somebody about Jesus, they may disagree with everything the Bible has to say. Oh, that's just a storybook. That's just a myth. Well, let me tell you about what happened to me. They might not like it, but they're not going to just say, no, that never happened. Guys, the stories that we have of who Jesus is and what he has done have power. So let me ask you this. Are you going to go? Are you going to leave this place today? And are you going to share the stories that God has given you? One of the coolest things I think that we see in the gospel accounts is we see multiple situations where Mary, Martha, and Lazarus show up. And one of my favorites is maybe Martha. Not because she's serving and we're a set up tear down church and we need people to serve, which we do. But more importantly, she sees that Jesus is Lord in that first account, but she misses what he has to say. And then when Lazarus is dead, in John 11 that we read just a little while ago, verse 20, it says, so Martha heard that Jesus was coming. She went and met him, but Mary remained seated in the house. Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you have been there, my brother would not have died. But even now I know that whatever you ask from God, God will give you. We see growth. We see sanctification. We see someone getting closer to understanding who God is. And then just weeks later in the story that we read today, she cannot wait to serve her God. When I think about the people in this room, and I've gotten to know some of your stories over the last few years, none of us were born perfect. I mean, you're cute babies, I'm sure. But none of us were born sinless, without blemish. But Jesus has come into our lives he has made himself known as God and as King, and we worship him as Lord this morning. We are the people of God, right? Are we God's people this morning? Yes. Then let's spend some time worshiping the God who has brought you from death into life. Let's pray.